We're talking about loving our way out of hatred. You know, the world has developed a whole system, a, a fashion of attempting to deal with hatred. And you can go down to Barnes and Noble, go through the self-help section, and you will find books addressing this topic and giving you pointers on how to, uh, to address hatred. Counselors find people all the time that are dealing with issues of hatred, and they offer their insights. Often those procedures may lessen the intensity of hatred. They may even offer us some release from destructive elements of hatred. But there's only one person who has the plan to get us past hatred, and that's God's. No human has devised a means of stepping outside of hatred into something else. God has done that. And so I, I want to just mention that we, we need to recognize that the stuff we're going to look at, you're not going to pick up something from last week in psychology today that's going to say, oh yeah, that's how you accomplish that. Because the world doesn't have this solution. It's God's. And by the way, that puts it in a whole different category. This is God's solution to hatred. The world primarily boils down to a couple of different techniques. One is fight. You learn how to fight the hatred. You may take on some aggression towards yourself in dealing with that. You may take on, uh, be assertive toward other people to deal with your hatred. But the other, the other again, again, I'm oversimplifying, but the other offering of the world is flight. You avoid it. You, you sidestep it. You distance yourself from the hatred because the hatred's bad for you. So primarily, everything in the world that the world offers us in regard to hatred boils down to fight or flight. It is sad when believers are satisfied addressing their hatred with the logic and the procedures that are proposed by the non-spiritual world. How many of us have dealt with our, and again, let me just remind if you're new, I'm using the word hatred, but it's the whole spectrum. Whether it's aggravation or hatred doesn't matter, the solution is the same. How many of us have tried to distance ourselves when we feel hatred and feel like, okay, that's going to accomplish the purpose? It doesn't. It doesn't accomplish God's purpose. Now, it, it may lessen the hatred, whatever, but that's human strategy. That's not God's strategy. While applying the secular techniques of examination, lessening intensity, and releasing the destructive nature of hatred may provide some level of relief, it is only a sovereign savior who offers a spiritual strategy by which one can love their way out of and beyond the clutches of hatred. We're not talking about just dealing with our hatred. We're talking about stepping past it. You know, it reminds me of Paul's discussion in Ephesians when he says, let him who stole steal no longer. When is a thief not a thief? Is it when he stops stealing? No, because the text then continues. But let him labor with his hands so that he can have something to share with those in need. When is a thief not a thief? A thief's not a thief when he gets a job so he can help somebody else. When do we stop hating? Is it when we lessen the intensity of the hatred? Is it when we avoid it? Is it when we aggressively address it? No. It's when we step out of hatred into God's solution, love. That's when we get past hatred. Because it is spiritual, there's a number of things that are just going to be true. Number one, it's not going to be popular in secular norms. Number two, it actually is going to, is, it's going to not find support within our human flesh. That human nature that we struggle with isn't going to say, oh, yeah, that's the way I want to do this. That's not going to, it's not going to happen that way. And it's not going to be easy. Harnessing our flesh isn't easy. Addressing the things that are amiss in our life isn't easy. But it's still God's plan. Some of you will remember, I think uh, this all happened October of last year, actually, the sentencing process of it all. But Botham Jean, who was a member of, uh, of our fellowship, went to Harding uh, led singing at his home congregation. Uh, you may remember that a, a police officer was getting off duty in Dallas and she came to the second floor instead of the third floor where her apartment was or vice versa. The door was open ajar. She went in, thought somebody had broken into her apartment and she ended up shooting Botham and she killed him. I, I just want you to, to conjure up. How, how would that go down with you? How would you address a son, a daughter, being murdered. I, I, I think it's safe to say this is, this is going to be the kind of stuff hatred is born of. Bertram, the father, said, it hurts me every day. 
How could we have lost Botham, such a sweet boy? He tried his best to live a good, honest life. He loved God. He loved everyone. How could this happen to him? My family is broken hearted. Sister Alyssa watched the video of Botham singing at church, and then the prosecutor said, what, what does that make you think of? And she says that I want my brother back. And then she went on to explain that her younger brother, that it's like the light behind his eyes has gone out. Again, wrestling with hatred, and then the evidence starts to come out. Officer Geyer entered the wrong apartment, probably caused by the fact that she was distracted from sexual text messages with a man she was having an affair with. Kind of makes the hatred easier, doesn't it? It is possible that Botham could have been saved from his fatal wound had she not taken time to delete those messages on the scene before contacting officials. The grieving mother obviously felt justice was done when the guilty verdict was read. The judge had to gavel the, the courtroom silent because the mother was so exuberant about the justice. But there's an amazing event that took place. This younger brother who the light had been taken from behind his eyes, according to his sister, he took the stand and said this. I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see I I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not going to say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. <laughs> Last week, we looked at verse 21 of Romans chapter 12. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. We just saw that young man do that. He stepped out of all hatred and stepped into love. Fight and flight may in some form decrease the damage of hatred, but engaging in God's principle and what what we're going to call it from this point on is aggressive good. Aggressive good is the first step beyond hatred, beyond irritation. Aggressive good. Three truths which will help us engage in aggressive good. Realize that evil is what we battle, not the person. That God empowers his children to win over evil and that victory is only ensured when his children choose the victory weapons rather than fighting by the flesh, which will bring about nothing but defeat. That's what we covered last time. Let's go and refresh ourselves with the text, Romans chapter 12. 
Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be in agreement with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for his wrath. For it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Practical realities of conquering evil with good begins with what we're going to talk about today. Managing your mouth. It begins with us deciding there's something in our speech that needs to happen if we're going to step out of hatred and into love. The text actually says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. God's strategy for loving our way beyond hatred begins with the mouth. You can't walk right if you can't talk right. So, so let's address some things about our mouth. First of all, what does it mean to curse? You know, obviously there's, I guess, the application of vulgarity is typically what we think of. But the Greek word actually means uh, it's a compounded from down and the word curse and the, the root word for curse is prayer. You're actually praying for bad to come to somebody. We're requesting that some kind of misfortune come into someone's life. There's a threefold application of that word through scripture. And the first one is sometimes it is saying those things negatively to God himself. David does that, and here's an example. Let death take them by surprise. He's talking about his enemies. Let them go down to Sheol alive because evil is in their homes and within them. What's he asking God to do? He doesn't just say, kill them. He says, send them to the grave alive. Bury him alive. Wow. And he's telling God that. Secondly, we talk negatively about others to others. That's cursing. That's cursing. Luke chapter 22, when a servant saw him sitting in the, in the firelight, looked closely at him and said, this man was with him too. And what does Peter do? Woman, I don't know him. A little while later, someone saw him and said, you were with him too. Man, I am not. About an hour later, they kept insisting this man certainly was with him since he's also the Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. You know what Peter's doing? He's cursing. He's talking bad about someone to other people. And then thirdly, there is a curse when we talk negatively directly to the other person. When we are honest. When we speak the truth. But what we're really doing is speaking negatively to the other person. The next day, he showed up while they were fighting. This is Stephen's recounting of Moses. And he tried to reconcile the fighting Hebrews peacefully, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why are you mistreating each other? But the one who was mistreating his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who appointed you as ruler and judge over us? Talking negatively to Moses, whose intention was to help negatively to the face. This beginning step just isn't about not talking trash about one who has done us wrong. It's about speaking well of the one whom we have decided that we're going to hate, whether again it be annoyed or hate. Speaking well about and to one who has inflicted us with evil might appear to be really foolish. How ignorant do you have to be to not speak evil to about someone who speaks evil to you? Well, Solomon gives us a little bit of a clue. Don't answer a fool according to his foolishness or you'll be like him yourself. When we choose the weapons of evil to combat the evil that's been done to us, folks, we are playing the fool's game. And all we do is we make ourselves just like the one who's harmed us. So he says, you don't curse. He said, you bless. So we better understand what blessing means. Again, we have a Greek word compounded from the, the words good and word. 
Um, actually, the word is eulago, to speak well of, and so usually in funerals and memorial services there is a eulogy, which speaks well of a person. That's what a blessing basically is, it's a speaking well. Again, we find a threefold application in scripture of what it means to speak well. Number one, to speak well of someone to God. Do you know how hard it is to hate someone that you're praying about? I mean really praying about? Those two are, are almost impossible. If I pray about someone that I'm struggling with and I'm praying honestly to God, it's really difficult for me to maintain that hatred. Hanging on a cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. You mean you don't want to hate the people that are doing this to you? Father, forgive them. Stephen does the same thing. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. You see, it's hard for hate to control the heart of one who is praying about those they're tempted to hate. But it also means to speak well of someone to other people to speak well of someone to other people. Barnabas is a good example of that. He refused to accept Paul's criticism of John Mark. And so he maintained a goodness when Paul could only see an evil. He refused to join him. But then lastly, it also means to speak well of someone to their face. James says, no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison with it. We bless our Father in heaven, and with it, we curse men who are made in God's likeness. And then he says, out of the same mouth, blessings and cursings, my brother, these things should not be this. So what James says, the cursings of others shouldn't be coming out our mouth. He's not saying we shouldn't be blessing God. He's saying we ought to be blessing everyone, even those that we would be tempted to speak evil of, to speak evil cursing about. We need to be guarding ourselves and speaking a blessing for them. God's instruction on loving yourself out of hatred begins with how you choose to use your own mouth. It goes beyond any decency realized by simply keeping quiet. This is not just a matter of I'm just going to bite my tongue and I will fulfill what God says. No, I'm sorry. Biting your tongue might get you through a moment. It might get you by blowing your top, but it is not going to get you into loving beyond hatred. It won't happen. And neither will mom's advice, or I think our kids were taught this in this little, if you can't say something nice, say nothing. That's not going to do it either. That won't do it. It won't accomplish God's purpose. God's plan says you speak but it's not speech that is contrived by your corrupted fleshly nature and consumed with caustic cruelty. You know, we, we talk about gossip as though maybe it's a, you know, it's just a little thing. Gossip is where this all works. Gossip is the mechanism by which evil takes over those who ought to be stepping out of hatred and practicing love. Gossip keeps us stuck. It is blessed speech. Echoing, first of all, into the throne room of God, sincerely shared with other people and expressed without hypocrisy to offenders themselves. That's what begins to get us out of hatred. Does that sound at all challenging to you? If it doesn't, you were either asleep or you checked out before things started. Because I'm going to tell you what, that is challenging. Every one of us in this, this room recognizes how challenging that is. But we need not allow our human nature to disregard the truth and the power of God's instruction. Remember, God has already promised we can win over evil. He hasn't said, well, you might. If all the stars align correctly and everybody follows suit, then guess what? You can win. No, he has promised we can win over evil. Now, either we believe that or we don't. And if we do believe it, we better be sensitive to what, how God says we can win. Human realizations and personal justifications carry no weight with the creator of the only real solution. You know, even though we know this stuff, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying much that's very new here, folks. We, we've had this stuff, we've had this stuff for a long time because we've had, we've had this. And so we, we've had this, but it's a matter of am I willing to do it or not? 
And sadly, our flesh gets to work and says, you know, the situation you're in is just a little bit different than what Dan's talking about. You know, you really, really were unjustly treated. And Dan's just talking about, you know, somebody gossiping about you. No, I'm sorry, folks. That doesn't float. There is no rationalization. There is no justification that carries any weight with the God who says, here is the solution. If I'm unyielding to God's solution, I'm unyielding to God. And self-justification is not going to cause God to go, oh, you're right. This might not work in your situation. might not work in your circumstance. Mankind's plan for dealing with hatred will even consider God's, God's path garbage. <laughs> Paul says we bless those who curse us. This is what Paul says. Bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us, yet we are treated like the world's garbage. Like everybody's trash. And then he says, not just in the past, I'm talking about right up to the present moment. When I do it God's way, the world treats me like trash. The pathway which leads out of hatred begins with managing our mouth with learning how to bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That's where it starts. Now, I'm just motivated to make this more than a, a sermon. Okay? I mean, th this needs to be changing lives, people. It needs to be changing my life. It needs to be changing your life. This needs to come home. So I've been thinking about how, how I might encourage all of us to dig deeper than what's just going on right now. And, and I have no idea if this will be helpful, if it won't be helpful, but at least it makes me feel like I'm giving that opportunity. I, I, I've prepared, and I'm going to continue to do this as we work through this series. I've prepared a sheet, and, and, and I'll actually we'll be sending this out as a link this afternoon on digging deeper. And it has a series of, of, of questions for you to meditate on and to process personally to take the things that we've looked at from God's word and not just say, oh yeah, that was, that was a really great sermon. No, no this, this, needs to, this needs to do more than just be a great or a bad sermon. What, that's not the point. The point is, if this is God's will, if this is God's truth, we had best be obeying.